Well, good evening. Um, I'm John Hogland, the director of the Northern Plains Ethics Institute, and it's uh, my pleasure to welcome uh, you uh, to this uh, uh, town hall meeting involving issues surrounding land grant universities and so forth. Before I uh, introduce the panel, uh, let me uh, just uh, have you recognize certain individuals that uh, have uh, uh, contributed a lot to the Ethics Institute. The associate director is Dr. Dennis Cooley, who is here, and then our um, administrator and designer who has designed our very attractive banner is Kathleen Cox, if you would just recognize, be recognized and so forth. Thank you uh, for that. Our um, panel tonight is um, obviously distinguished um, in many ways. Uh, we have, um, and they're all doctors, so we can dispense with that. Uh, <laughs> uh, closest to me is uh, Tom Ezern, uh, who is a distinguished professor of, uh, a university distinguished professor at NDSU and uh, uh, busies himself teaching Great Plains history and uh, uh, other uh, related topics. Then uh, we have um, Richard Hansen, who is our interim president. I'm sure you all know him, and it's a little bit like um, the uh, old days have come back because some 15 or so years ago, he and I and a number of other people were working together in the area of ethics and what we, um, what we developed then has become uh, the uh, Northern Plains Ethics Institute. So we know that, that he has um, a uh, real burden for ethics, and as uh, most of us do. Then um, James Carlson, who is the, uh, for, uh, the founder of Prax Institute, um, has uh, since sold Prax Institute, is now uh, developing a um, management company, JDC Management, and um, uh, Dr. Carlson has been a, um, uh, a benefactor to the city of uh, Fargo, uh, giving us a, one of our libraries in the southern uh, part of uh, Fargo. So uh, he, um, uh, too, uh, I think, has a real concern for ethics. We have, and then uh, our Dean of uh, uh, Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, who is Tom Riley on the, uh, the end, and uh, he uh, has been a supporter of what we've been doing for some uh, many, many years, and uh, so uh, at any rate, let me uh, just, uh, uh, mention that uh, we will have each of the panelists uh, then uh, probably in the order in which they are sitting um, uh, each uh, speak for about seven or eight minutes and then after uh, that uh, we will have the panel uh, comment on each other's uh, points of view and uh, uh, President Hansen has said that uh, he has uh, uh, a full evening and uh, has some students that he needs to be with uh, starting around 8 o'clock, so we will excuse him at that point, um, regretfully. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, we'll still continue on, uh, and uh, we are uh, scheduled uh, to um, end the evening at uh, 9 o'clock. Uh, after um, a break and after uh, President Hansen is on his way, uh, we'll take a short uh, uh, break for uh, refreshments and uh, so forth, and then uh, reassemble uh, for uh, audience comment and questions uh, for uh, the panel. The um, Land-grant tradition, a very powerful tradition, 
it's uh, become uh, that. Uh, and, and if you imagine how it started in 1862, uh, once the, uh, as the Civil War was beginning uh, to uh, gather steam, uh, in the middle of that war, they still, uh, and uh, Mr. Morrill, uh, conceived of the idea of that the war will be over someday and we need uh, to educate a very large, large nation. Uh, and so the Morrill Act was signed in 1862 and um, I think uh, Tom Ezer will have some comments about that so I, um, I won't uh, uh, continue in that, uh, in that vein. But this is also a transitionary year for us. Uh, we're between uh, uh, presidential administrations and uh, times like that are always a time to uh, reflect on, uh, take stock, uh, to refocus if uh, need be uh, what it is that we are about as uh, a land-grant uh, university. Um, we uh, also are um, very uh, concerned about various values, since this is, of course, an ethical uh, uh, presentation of the town meeting. The, the values that we are uh, going to be examining are land-grant values. Um, to ask the question, are they different substantially from other, uh, from other academic uh, values? Um, how does the land-grant tradition uh, uh, compare to the um, uh, classical academic, uh, academic uh, set of values, or, or do, they, uh, the, do the two coalesce at very significant places? And of course, um, the future always throws up new values and new problems, new structures that we need to be um, aware of, and maybe uh, the panel will uh, comment on what those uh, might uh, also be. Um, and then finally, we also want to give some thought to the requirements of the state of North Dakota and not only North Dakota, but the region as well. And so um, at that point then, uh, we'll just move down the panel and uh, we will begin with uh, the remarks of uh, Tom Ezer. Where do you want to do this, John? Here, I, here? I, what's ever comfortable. Go from here. I didn't hear this. All right. Now to be careful, I'm a historian. All I know how to do is tell stories. And there are people here who have pretty much heard all of mine before. I had to search for one maybe you hadn't heard yet. His own formal education amounted only three months. And, but Hale Chisholm, Hale Chisholm was the epitome of the educated man. He delighted equally in the forge and in the lyceum. He was a great teacher because he was a great lifelong learner. Hale Chisholm taught blacksmith and wrote poetry at North Dakota Agricultural College. He was born in 1851 in Chazzy, New York. Chisholm held out of school for ill health, but somehow he was well enough to assist his father at the forge. Subsequently, he apprenticed with another smith, got a job in the locomotive shops of the uh, Vermont Central Railway, cast his first vote for Ulysses S. Grant for president in 1872, held several other jobs, Started a family, settled a while in South Dakota, came to Fargo to work in the shops of the Northern Pacific Railway. 1902, that was the year that the NP shops moved over into Dilworth, he became an instructor at North Dakota Agricultural College, where he served until his retirement in 1937, which is the year John started here. <laughs> this, this was a fortunate match. Blacksmithing, you see, was a real common study for students at the AC in those days. And Chisholm students remembered him as a teacher not only of skills, but also of wisdom. Snorri Thorfinson, who went on to a distinguished career in the Extension Service and as a local historian, wrote of Chisholm in retrospect, 
While I was not much of a hand at iron work, when I took work unto you, I always felt I had learned two lessons that stayed by me. The dignity of labor well done and an appreciation of art. Now Chisholm insisted that his iron work was no mere utilitarian pursuit, but rather a matter of artistic fulfillment. He kept a commonplace book, a commonplace book, a little book in which he wrote sayings and observations. Now reposes among his other papers at the Institute for Regional Studies, NDSU. Among the jottings of Chisholm, I find the statement, I've never regretted a dollar spent for loveliness. Some other common places from the pen of Hale Chisholm. To sit idle when you feel you should be doing something is the hardest thing in the world. Work is love made visible. Much time and money spent for so-called higher education. But many recipients of this higher education never accomplish anything with it outside the drawing. Chisholm believed that those who were inclined to be bookish needed to learn the dignity of labor with their hands. Those who worked with their hands needed to learn to regard their work as art and to appreciate poetry. Thus he had something to teach everyone. Something he continued to learn all through his life. At lyceums and literary events on campus, there was the blacksmith, Hale Chisholm, and he had questions. Frequently, he was called upon to compose and recite verse at special occasions, significant events of the college or of his church, First Methodist. Among his commissions of ironwork, the iron gates that stand at the southeastern entrance of this university. He also fashioned the ornamental gate for the Teddy Roosevelt cabin compound at the state capital complex and made the trowel, hammered the trowel, that laid the cornerstone for the state capital in 1932. 1931, the college uh, faculty awarded Chisholm an honorary degree, Master of Artisans, saying he's elevated the art, the art of craftsmanship in iron working to a fine art. He had to retire in 37 on account of deafness, no doubt induced by the forge. 1941, the college community convened, I like to think about this, convened for a grand honorary dinner and for observances in the Little Country Theater upstairs in Old Maine where a quartet sang the Anvil Chorus, <laughs> after which Chisholm and all the others adjourned to attend the Lyceum. After the death of his wife Mary in 31, he lived with his daughter Anna until 1951, when the old Smith died. Late in life, he wrote, I hear them say he's passing fast, and you know, what they say is true. I'm not the man they used to know in 1892, it was not so very long ago they called me hale and strong. They found me ready night and day to tote my load along. My place beside the anvil true I filled with honest pride. My hands ne'er shrank from the hardest tasks by daily needs supply. If you listen to those stanzas, you can hear the hammer in them. If you reflect upon the life of Hale Chisholm, master of artisans, you can achieve a pretty good understanding of what we come to call the land grant ideal. You know, back home, I've got a, a big trunk that sits next to my desk, desk. My old cousin Burtis gave it to me. She told me the story that my great-grandparents gave that to my grandpa, Ezer, uh, just before he boarded the train. And he packed it up with his stuff, and they put him on the train to go to Manhattan, to take the winter short course at Kansas Agricultural College. Winter short course. So I, I, I like to think about him, packing up from the farm, and leaving the house where uh, my family still lives on that farm. According to the catalog of that year, the short course was taught on a different plane than the regular term, more concrete, more, less theoretical, work immensely practical, it says, and is taught, of course, when the farm work was slack in the winter. Admission requirements, somebody in my family at least has certification, be at least 18 years of old and be of good moral character. <laughs> I've got his textbooks that he brought home in 1905 from the short course. This is the short course in agriculture, the winter course, specifically for farmers. Most of them with no secondary education whatsoever. So I find his physics textbook, 
Principles of Plant Culture by E.S. Goff of Wisconsin University. What surprises me a little bit is to find among them Sir Walter Scott's Lady of the Lake, a book of Washington Irving's sketches. Surprises me only a little bit because agricultural colleges were never confined to teaching about crops and livestock. They always provided, as their congressional creators said, liberal and practical education. And again, I, I got his composition book, handwritten, mixture of pencil and pen. Notes, things he was supposed to memorize, clearly little maxims, supposed to memorize these things. And then his lecture notes. And yeah, there, there's some physics formulae in there, there's some handy recipes for dosing horses. And then it looks as though Grandpa absorbed a fair bit of Oliver Goldsmith, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Washington Irving, Robbie Burns, Matthew Arnold, William Shakespeare, Benjamin Franklin, Walter Scott, and the historian Thomas Carlyle. Did I say that mention this was the short course for farmers in the winter? Now, I hope, I suspect by now you've taken my point about the ideal of the land-grant university. Land-grant college, now land-grant university, is a glorious American invention, like nothing else in the world. An idea that originated with the democratic zeitgeist of the antebellum America, attained actuality with Republican dominance of the Congress during the Civil War, and is credited by historical memory to Senator Justin Morrill of Vermont, father of the land-grant university system, author of the Morrill Act, 1862. That act famously promised subsequent generations of Americans a liberal and practical education, it says, in a whole new class of institutions of higher education. More specifically, the land-grant ideal comprises two essential elements, the first of which is access. The Morrill Act threw open the heavy gates of college to the sons and daughters of farmers and laborers who never before in history could have aspired to higher education. This is why the historian Earl Ross has described the land-grant college as democracy's college. And the second essential element of the land-grant ideal has to do with curriculum. Agriculture was a sine qua non, but studies in the land-grant colleges, Senator Morrill explained, comprehended his words, not only instruction for those who hold the plow or follow a trade, but such instruction as any person might need with the world before them where to choose and without exclusion of those who might prefer to adhere to the classics. The union of these two elements is the land-grant ideal, an ideal of empowerment and inclusiveness. Historian Alan Nevins concludes that the assumption, in his words, behind the land-grant movement was what, that liberty and equality could not survive unless all men had full opportunity to pursue all occupations at the highest, possible, highest practical level. No restrictions of class, or fortune, or sex, or geographical position, no restrictions whatever should operate, Nevins writes. The assumption of which he writes is not a plan or even a map. It's an ideal. And it's a fine example of what we historians have come to call agency. Historians of agency, and I am one, reject the idea that history is driven by mere deterministic forces. Historians of agency say, we make our choices and we live with the consequences. A person exemplifying agency in history, such as Justin Moore, believes that it might just be possible to form a more perfect union through that equality of opportunity afforded by access to higher education and by choice of curricular options. As heirs of Justin Morrill, we inherit not only his ideal, but also the agency implicit in it. No restrictions, Nevin says. Possibilities as wide open as our prairies <coughs> of yellow and green. Let us so conduct ourselves as to be able to say with N. Scott Mamaday, 
The journey began one day long ago on the edge of the northern plains. Let us so imagine ourselves that we will be able to say, as Mamadé writes of his people, the vainglorious Kyle, they had conceived a good idea of themselves. They had dared to imagine and determine who they were. Well, God grant me such an epitaph. Thanks, John. Thank you. Now for a more sober view. Uh, <laughs> gotcha. In contrast uh, to the inebriated view? Or? <laughs> All of the above. <clears throat> President Hanson. Yeah, thank you, John. And uh, thank you, Tom. I, uh, yeah, um, my uh, presentation will be far less um, far less classically endowed, and, uh, uh, but nevertheless, I hope uh, informative for you. Um, a couple, I really, my comments are gonna be in sort of three, three clumps. I have some introductory comments about the land grant university, um, and then I wanna use a, a very specific, sp specific example from our university to demonstrate how the land grant principle is evolving, how it's alive much as Tom described to us. And then I want to end with uh, just uh, uh, what I call the three elements that facilitate a land grant, a connected land grant university. And then th th those three things are really the challenges for us all. First of all, I, I don't know if you knew, if you know this, but uh, I confirmed it with the historian I'm sitting next to just before we started. The original land grant uh, bill uh, was vetoed in 1860 by President Buchanan. And uh, uh, the good senator from Vermont brought it back uh, two years later, and uh, uh, senator, uh, President Lincoln signed it in the midst of the Civil War. I bring that up only because, in some ways, uh, the land-grant expression was, was reaction formation, reaction to classical education, uh, reaction to, in some ways, irrelevant education, and also uh, a reaction to what people thought the future was going to bring. And uh, in that sense, this American invention, and of course, uh, Dr. Eason uh, emphasized that, and we, and we want to make sure you understand, this is a uniquely American experience. Uh, there is no other country that has followed a model quite like, like ours. The, um, The part of that genius that is so impressive to me is that the land grant system that we've created, and this is especially obvious here uh, uh, at North Dakota State, is, is that it's a living model. It isn't, it isn't something that is cast in stone and, and structurally stays the way it always will be. And sometimes we think about uh, the land or any kind of organizational structure as being uh, structurally one way and then but land grant universities are intrinsically very different from each other while they're very much the same uh, uh, in comparison to each other. But they're living in, in the sense that the relevant organizational strategies within a land grant mentality are intrinsically adaptive. A and we have to solve problems. Uh, to me, um, when I, when I think about North Dakota State University, uh, I tend to think of four words. I think of excellence, I think of service, which is a fundamental part of the land-grant mission. I think of problem-solving, which is a fundamental part of the land-grant model, and I think of innovation. Those four words, uh, strike me as, as the expression of our land-grant attitude here at North Dakota State. Now, one of the points I want, to, I want to make tonight is that we differ very fundamentally from other universities in many ways, but in the, in, in the way I want to share with you tonight, we differ in terms of our stakeholders. Now, when you think of a stakeholder, uh, what's the definition of a stakeholder? Someone who has an interest in an organization and has communion with that organization in one way or another. 
Land grant universities were initially charged with educating farmers and tradesmen in the agricultural and mechanical arts. And you can see, you can read those words in the initial legislation. Again, when you do that, you create a different set of stakeholders. And as I think about it, who are the stakeholders for North Dakota State University? Well, our students are stakeholders. Our faculty and staff are stakeholders. They have an investment in the place. But who else? When you think about us and agriculture, we are um, connected to almost every group in the state, whether they're uh, commodity groups, whether they're professional groups, we're connected. So literally, our sandbox, our, our, our play yard, our work environment is everybody. As they think about their role, particularly in North Dakota, and, and, and this is where our, our land grant expressions differ because uh, in states like, mm, let me take uh, New Jersey or Pennsylvania, I, I think the expression of the land grant ideal is different than it is in North Dakota. I think that's a function of environment. Stakeholders differ, we differ from other universities in the sense of the number of stakeholders, the way they're connected to the university, and the importance that those stakeholders have to our program. Because we must adjust. <laughs> One of the first calls I took, this was before Menard fell in the hole. <laughs> That's funny, but it's not. <laughs> but one of the first calls I took was from a farmer, and I didn't know him from Adam, and he said, your wheat varieties didn't work this year. I said, excuse me, who, who are you? It was a farmer, and he wanted to tell me that our wheat varieties didn't work. Well, when I, when I called some people over in Lascard Hall, they told me, yeah, no wheat varieties work this summer because of the lousy weather. Um, the point is, he was a stakeholder. He has an interest in what we do. In fact, a very, very important interest in what we do. So stakeholders for North Dakota State include state and federal legislators, county commissioners, because remember, the tripartite function of, well, I'll take the extension service, for example, is federal, state, and local. Those funding patterns come together in the expression of the experiment station and in the expression of the extension service. Um, stakeholders are county commissioners, county office holders, city office holders, local and state and national program partners, community leaders, farmers, families. They're all stakeholders for an institution like North Dakota State. Now, I, I, I want to quickly move to my second point. Um, <coughs> In North Dakota, uh, we have developed an instrument that is unique in, in, in all of the land grant universities in the, in the country. In terms of feedback back into the system to give us an understanding of what our priorities should be, we created an organization called the State Board for Agricultural Research, and then we added the E at the end, and education. It's called SBEAR. And when I left NDSU in 1995, we didn't have this organization. And it's here now. And uh, I think it's one of the most interesting expressions of the land-grant mission that I've ever seen. Uh, this is a group. Uh, I sit on it. Uh, D.C. Costin, the Vice President for Agriculture, sits on it. Uh, Dwayne Houck, our, our, our uh, Extension Director, he sits on it. Our Experiment Station Director sits on it. And so does the Dean of the College of Agriculture. But the rest of them, are a variety of different kinds of people. And th these folks are what I call idea developers. They take ideas, they create priorities, they help us complete our mission. No other state does it the way we do. We have a unique model, and I'm watching it work for the first time. And uh, uh, on April 8th, we'll get to present the priorities for SBAR to the State Board of Higher Education. They've given me 30 minutes, and I'll use people like D.C. Costin, 
and Dwayne Houck and other folks to help me present uh, our SBEAR list of priorities for the next biennium. We listen to the stakeholders, we respond to the stakeholders, because that's what we do. Now the last thing I want to leave you with um, is how do you deal with a rapidly changing world uh, in terms of an educational concept that was really founded in 1862. It's, 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 it's been uh, modified and changed many times and there's been lots of legislation around uh, the whole issue of the land grant university. But how do we assure that this fundamental American invention will continue to be functional? Well, there are three, <coughs> three answers to that question, and these are on the quiz that Tom will give you before you get any snacks. First, one element that will facilitate a connected land-grant university is strong vision and strong leadership. You have to have people who believe in what we do, much like what Tom shared with you in terms of this, this wonderful person, this wonderful blacksmith, who forged not just metal, but forged people's minds and created ideas. The second thing is you need an infrastructure and an organization and a reorganization that is adaptive. A living organization always adapts to the situations that it finds itself in, and we have to do that. And then lastly, a great land-grant university exists on the back of a fabulous faculty, a fabulous community, and great relationships with those stakeholders out in the state. If we, can, if we can somehow corral those kinds of things, this American experiment that's been going on for more than 100 years will continue to be a functioning, responsive manner in which we educate not just undergraduates, but the whole state. Thank you, John. Thank you. And now for a, a view from outside of the university walls, uh, but still having started within the university is James Charles. When John first talked to me about this topic, one of his questions that he, he probably brought it up to me several ways, but the one that stuck was with the land grant colleges, what was their original purpose? And are we continuing to follow that purpose, that theme, that intent? I found it fascinating as I started doing some reading, number one, the Morrell Act. Stop and think about it for a second. 1862, we're in the middle of the Civil War. We're having difficulty, both sides are having difficulty funding the war, and we're approving an act that, it, that gives away 30,000 acres of ground to each congressional representative. Why would you do that? when you need, you, I don't know how many of you went and looked at the Morrell Act. Two acts before the Morrell Act, they were, the, the act was to release funds for the quartermaster so they could feed the troops. The act just before the Morrell Act is authorizing ground for the creation of the state of Nevada. The Morrell Act, the act following that is approving funds for horses, cavalry, ammunition for the war. If you're fighting a war, what is your focus on education? I did some more reading, <laughs> and this was sort of fascinating. Of course, it depends upon your sense of humor, I guess. As, 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 as President Hansen had previously said, this had been previously submitted to Congress and defeated. It was defeated by the southern states, at least according to my reference. So now that the southern states were not in Congress, now they could push it through, again, for building the nation once it's brought back together. Fascinating, fascinating that during the middle of a war, you would stop and think about education. When you're looking at the Morale Act of 1862, then there's the Hatch Act of 1887 where they allow the establishment of experimental stations to go in conjunction with the land grant. The original land grant was for agricultural, mechanical arts, and military tactics. And then there's later text in the, in the act that talks about classical studies, etc. should also be supported. 
So that gives latitude. So we're not talking about just agriculture, we're not talking about just mechanical arts, we're not talking about just military. The classics were also allowed. In the Hatch Act, they sort of reiterated the same thing. Now we're talking about teaching, research, and service. But now we're supporting the extension. And in an agricultural state, I was raised in Iowa, another agricultural state, with, with another excellent extension service. The citizens of that state rely heavily on extension, just like the citizens of this state rely heavily on extension. And the research done by that extension service has a major impact on how they handle their agricultural assets. It's a, it's a huge guide. Phenomenal that they were thinking about this back in 1862. But then again, what did we have going on for us in agriculture then? In 1890, we have another Morale Act. This time, they're giving money to the land-grant institutions. This time, they're allowing the African Americans in the southern states to create their own, or the southern states to allow they use their land grant money to create institutions for the normal schools for the African American students. That's in 1890, sometime after the Civil War. And then in 1906, we have the Adams Act that follows that, where now we're giving money from the federal government to the Extension Service to support the land grant colleges. The only point I'm trying to make is that the essence of the land grant is not just agriculture. It is really supporting higher education, getting it into the hands of the people. Every state has a land grant. In fact, there are territories I had forgotten the U.S. even owns, and they have land grants. There are 107 land grant institutions that came out of this act. By the way, tidbit of trivia, for those of you that are adding numbers up, if North Dakota became a state in 1889, this is approved in 1862, how'd that happen? North Dakota had five years to get their 30,000 per congressional leader. What I want to know is what happened to the other 59,000 acres. Okay. Um, that was a attempt of humor, just in case you're <laughs> falling asleep. All right. Land-grant institutions. If you look at the land-grant institutions, in my interaction with state and federal law, it is the intent of the law that's appropriate. So to, to sort of answer John's question that he put to me as we were chatting about this, I think it's appropriate for the land grant institutions to push away from the hard line that may have been the interpretation of the law in 1862. It is the intent of the law. The intent of the law is to bring education to the people. In, the, in 1862, there was, a, there was another place where I read where the, they had the colleges, the, the land-grant colleges, didn't have any teachers. And this goes to, to reinforce what we're talking about, about Chisholm. You had to have somebody that was taking their experience, their training. They may not have had the formal education, but their experience, their training, that counts. We've got to start somewhere, and they've done an excellent job. I was also amazed. My data is now four years old. But eight out of 10 of the largest universities in the US are land grant institutions. That's impressive. We're sitting here with, with the big boys. Whether you're a division one or not, you're sitting here with the big boys. Okay? Gotta hold your head high for that one. 15% of all college students in the US are land grant. I have no idea how many colleges there are in the US. I have no idea how many college students there are in the U.S. because now you're talking full-time, part-time, incidental, et cetera. I really don't know, but 15% in the land-grant institutions and 107 institutions. That's a, that's, a, that's a significant impact. But thanks to the foresight of the leadership in all the land-grant institutions, and this was the fact that blew me away. Two out of every three doctoral graduates come from a land-grant institution. So for those people that might think land-grant is strictly agriculture, two out of three doctoral graduates coming out of a land-grant, we're covering the sciences, we're covering agriculture, we're covering the humanities. This is, this is, 
this was so insightful of our congressional leaders in 1862 to provide us this kind of a basis, to provide us this kind of a solid education for 100, 200, we'll, we'll still be doing this in 300 years. I, I think it's, uh, yeah, maybe we've deviated, but we've followed the intent. And my hat goes off to all the land grants. I'm done. Thank you. Dean Riley? Uh, <clears throat> a little bit of the rest of the story. I, I came up here to North Dakota from uh, the University of Illinois. And um, while most states talk about Justin Morrill as being the father of the Land Grant Act, um, at uh, the University of Illinois, they talk about uh, Jonathan Baldwin Turner. You probably never heard of him. <laughs> he was a professor at uh, Illinois College, which was founded in 1829. And in 1851, he suggested a, uh, a system of industrial colleges um, that uh, would be supported by the federal government um, and uh, that where there would be one in each state um, uh, to uh, educate the industrial classes. That's the way that he put it. Um, and in fact, the University of Illinois was called when it became a land grant, Illinois Industrial College. Um, long before the Morrill Act was passed, uh, there were other colleges that were state controlled and that could be considered to be one of the, the models for the land grant. I think what became Michigan State was uh, the Agricultural College of Michigan and um, it was uh, formed in the 1850s as well before the Morrill Act was, uh, was passed. But there was a significant movement um, that came out of uh, uh, educators um, who saw the need for developing uh, uh, higher education, further education, mostly for people who are in, in uh, the agricultural sector. And of course, most people. Um, it was a very, very large sector in terms of the uh, numbers of people who were involved in it uh, in the 1850s and 60s. Um, it's kind of interesting because the Land Grant Act probably changed the ratio of people involved in agriculture in this country in a way that never would have been expected when uh, uh, when land grants were invented. Um, the, um, I should also mention that Illinois College, where, where Turner taught, um, I, just to continue the story on, was founded by a group that called itself, um, after they founded Illinois College, the Yale Band, because they were missionaries, both in terms of higher education um, and in terms of, uh, of religion, um, from one class at Yale University who wanted to go out to the West to essentially establish higher education, and they established Illinois College, which is still existing at the present time as a, uh, as a private uh, uh, college in Jacksonville, Illinois, about half an hour west of Springfield. Uh, so that in essence, um, uh, the institution that Turner came from and where he got uh, his philosophy and expressed it was a private school, not a public one and was based upon, I guess you would say, uh, uh, some of the tenets of classical education from Yale back in New Haven. So it's not all uh, a bunch of farmers sort of getting smart about the whole thing. It, uh, it, there, there's, a, there's an interconnection of, uh, uh, of ideas and places that, uh, that the land grant came from. Um, NDSU is in kind of a sweet spot at the moment. Um, one that was leveraged, I would say, by Joe Chapman, but also by uh, accidents of poli politics, and that is that we are a land grant um, uh, that uh, is right in square in the middle of the uh, largest urban center in the state of North Dakota, and that puts us in a very, very interesting situation, um, uh, one that is shared by some places but not by others. Um, I guess the University of Minnesota would be one. We are, in fact, potentially a metropolitan land grant serving both the agricultural population in the state itself and also um, the urban population um, of, uh, of the state of North Dakota. And in fact, um, that's something that I think we're beginning to take a little bit more seriously. You know, I, when you put together um, the idea of research service uh, and, uh, and teaching, uh, the land grant is kind of an interesting place and it came into its own, I would think, um, very early on, partly because of the experiment stations. 
Um, I, the experiment station's engaged in uh, things like uh, scientific agriculture. Um, I, they, uh, plant breeding um, was extremely important. Animal breeding was extremely important. Uh, genetics uh, and biology were parts of sciences uh, in the agricultural realm that were extremely important. And um, in fact, if you take a look at universities in this country, the places that were doing, honest to God, applied research, but also basic research, uh, before World War II were in fact the land-grant institutions. And they were doing it to a great extent out of the colleges of agriculture that were uh, their heart uh, to a great extent. Um, I, also, it's interesting, I, I came from Illinois and there they had an amazing paint chemistry basis to their incredibly good chemistry department. I came to North Dakota State and I discovered that we had an incredible paint chemistry basis to what is an absolutely fine chemistry department and polymers uh, and polymeric materials department today. Um, I, uh, and, and those are some of the areas, uh, agriculture and polymers and paint coatings um, that, uh, that some land grants um, participated in in terms of, uh, of truly basic research way back in the, uh, uh, in the old days, as early as the turn of the, uh, between the beginning of the 20th century. Um, you know, at the end of World War II, uh, Vannevar Bush, um, at the urging of uh, President Roosevelt, um, produced uh, a, an incredible piece of work called Science, the Endless Frontier, and it kind of designed uh, the direction that scientific research um, and the research that research universities would take for the last half of the 20th century. And if you ever get a chance, you can just go and look it up. It's, it's available. You can Google it and read it. And it is a very, very modern document, despite the fact that it was produced in 1945. Um, it led to the development of the National Science Foundation. Um, it led to uh, a, a tremendous infusion of research dollars uh, into education, inst educational institutions, most of it going to land grants. Um, Except for, well, even if you take a look at it today, um, one land grant that people don't seem to recognize, and that is MIT, <laughs> which is, in fact, one of the two private land grant institutions uh, in this country. Uh, Cornell is the other. Um, all the others are essentially public institutions. Um, but, but, you know, you look back at, uh, at NDSU or NDAC um, at the beginning of the 20th century in 1900. And the research that was going on here was amazingly good. This is where ideas of genetics were being um, uh, fooled around with. Um, and by the 1930s, um, we had produced at the, from this institution um, uh, plants that essentially changed the face of agriculture in the western part of the United States. Uh, Series Hall, uh, Dwayne knows this, all this is kind of low-level stuff, but Series Hall is uh, not named just after the goddess of wheat. It is named after um, a variety of wheat that was uh, released in 1926, I think it was. Um, and by 1931, um, it essentially had taken over most of Western Canada uh, and North Dakota. Um, but it had, uh, it had increased the amount of wheat produced out here uh, by a huge amount, um, a huge amount. And it was just one of the many, many um, plants that were uh, varieties that were uh, introduced um, for us and for this region of the country. Um, and that has led um, right now to us being in the top 10 uh, in terms of, uh, of crop production in about 14 different plants, I believe, isn't it? Dwayne, is it 14 or so that we're within the top 10? Oh, I think you have to include honeybees in that. Mm -hmm. So it's not all plants, I guess. But, it's a, uh, but if you take a look at it, this was the base, this kind of stuff that was going on for 45 years here, longer than that, was the thing that allowed us to begin to participate uh, in the new uh, research funding model that was presented after World War II. Uh, and we've done a pretty good job of it. Although, I've got to say that we did not grow outside of agriculture, 
paint chemistry uh, into that research institution until really the last 15 or 16 years where it became generalized and we became a, a much more balanced institution than we have been uh, in the past. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's the direction of the land grant in the future um, it is, uh, is, it's obviously going to be doing more of the same, but you ask how much can it do? If you take a look at, uh, at I believe it's corn acres from 1998 to 2008 in this state, I think they increased by 425%. Um, soybeans have increased to over 4 million acres, I think, uh, in this last year. Um, completely changing the kind of mix of agriculture that goes on in this place and actually creating a huge, huge amount of wealth for the state. Um, forget about oil. Agriculture has produced a tremendous amount of wealth. And all of that, or most of it, has come out of ideas and basic research that comes from this institution, from this little point on the map of North Dakota. And it's not just us um, that uh, have benefited from this, but if you take a look across all of Western Canada as well, and the states to the west of us and to the south of us, they have benefited as well. And not just there. If you take a look at Uganda, if you take a look at places in Latin America, you take a look at places very far removed from those that we see around us, it has created a huge amount of wealth. And this is just one of a network uh, of institutions, 107 of them, you say, um, that exist around this country. We are a powerful force for good, not just for the education of people, um, but for the well-being of people. Um, and uh, the land grant is probably one of the, one of the incredible inventions um, put together in a variety of ways from public and private sources um, of Western man um, in the 20th century or 19th century, I guess you would say. And it is interesting that it came out of a time of tremendous um, of war and, uh, and how would you call it, uh, a time when this country was uh, being torn apart. Let's see. Well, I think since President Hansen must be on his way in a few minutes, why don't we um, have you make your first comments to the panel and... Um... Uh, <clears throat> hmm. I, uh, I've sat here and I, I'm, I'm actually um, amazed at what we've heard tonight because it ranges from the lyrical to the economic. Uh, from the heart of an individual to the heart of an economy. It's, it's a fascinating invention, this land-grant thing. And um, what I'm uh, uh, impressed with is, is how well this invention has worked. But let me go back to something that we, we've all said in one way or another. The key to success of the land-grant idea is its adaptability because it's been able to adapt to all the kinds of changes that have occurred since uh, 1850. I mean, if you, if you go back to the original land-grant idea, well, that's a lot of water under the bridge. And, and I, I think the invention has, has uh, as, as these learned folks have suggested, has uh, served us very well. And uh, uh, for those of us that uh, are in that two out of three that have a degree from a land-grant university, I certainly have all three of my degrees from a land-grant university. <laughs> Um, it is a powerful and thoroughly relevant education, and uh, and that's that's uh, that's what I gleaned from uh, from from these folks up here. And I do appreciate you giving me my leave so I can uh, deal with other situations, but I appreciate that. And thank you all for coming tonight. I, we 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 all appreciate that. We were concerned that it might be just us talking to each other, which would be boring. Stimulating. Boring. <laughs> it would be boring. So thank you, John. You're welcome. Thanks for being here.
couple minutes and uh, then we'll break for uh, for refreshments. But uh, comments, critiques. Well, let me go back to what President Hansen was talking about with the shareholders. And I think that's imperative that everybody appreciate that the shareholders really do encompass all 648,000 North Dakota <clears throat> residents and uh, quite frankly a few residual people living on the Minnesota border. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it, it's imperative that we understand what it is the students are trying to accomplish. <clears throat> and of course, I can sit here saying that, like, as if you all know exactly what you're going to do when you grow up. I'm still working on it, so I wish you luck. Um, but if you have a relative idea as to where you want to go, or better yet, if you have no clue in the world, which relates a little more to me, um, it's imperative you have the opportunity to have access to a broad spectrum of classes. Because it prepares you for so many things. By the way, I'd also like to point out that the original paint stores were in pharmacies. Uh, and uh, just as a little aside that really should bore all of you to death, paint was so strong in the pharmacy era that Upjohn actually made a round pill somewhere in the mid-1800s and painted it with gold paint. And it was so good, it was so beautiful, they were perfect. Uh, they were probably, well, gold wasn't worth that much then, but they were, they were just gorgeous. The nice part of it was, is remember gold not much attacks gold so the little round tablet that you swallowed was the same little round tablet that came out <laughs> so art and paint at its finest but anyway um, you know, in a land grant college to be able to be exposed to a variety of classes to, to taste test different disciplines you will not appreciate until you get to be my age the benefit of that if i had any clue what i was going to do when i grew up a lot of those classes that i took that just struck me as interesting i would have paid just a little more attention because it might have made me a little bit smarter in my profession and that's why you know when you when you look at the law and is are there people that are concerned that we should be that we've deviated from the original intent and that, that we've allowed too many other disciplines in, too much liberal arts, too much of this, too much of that. No. We've done what I think the law intended, which is educate the populace in a university that is affordable. Okay, in a university that's affordable, I didn't see that in the law, but that's the way most of the land grants go, except for MIT and some of those. But anyway, um, it, it's, I think this university and the land grant universities are fulfilling that obligation. And as students, you need to take advantage of it. And as faculty, where are your students going? How do you know you've prepared them to get there? And as a business consumer, what is it that I want for a new graduate? What am I looking for? What do I really need? And most of us business people don't really know because nobody has engaged us on the interaction of helping us understand what we need. So we take the obvious things, which are usually when people say there's a problem. I found usually when somebody says that this is the problem, usually this is the problem. What they see superficially is usually not the problem. That's just a, an abscess. This is the real problem. How do we fix it? So, I just really want to underscore what, what President Hansen was saying. We really need to get all the shareholders together. Are we on target? This is not a matter of are we following the law. This is, are we on target? Are our students accomplishing what they need to accomplish? Are they ending up in the jobs that are rewarding? Are the businesses able to offer them the jobs? Do the businesses have access to the people they need so they can create the environment they want? And can the universities help us facilitate this entire economic endeavor you're talking about? <clears throat> In my opinion, that's what it's all about. <clears throat> and I think NDSU has done a very good job of growing, trying to address these needs. 
There's always more we can do. More comment, or should we break for? Throw it open. <laughs> <laughs> Throw it open for our yeah, comments, right? We'll, uh, we'll uh, take a five minute, uh, 10 minute break five. and five. And then uh, we have refreshments out in the hall and um, the facilities and everything. So, and then we'll come back and we'll hear from the audience.